Hi Artis, what's up? May I have a word, sir? Sure, sure, sure. The result of my analysis of comments and interactions with the community clearly shows that the first non-Indian <laughs> request for a plane coverage is the Russian Su-57, <laughs> sir. The Sukhoi 57? Well, if they want the Sukhoi 57, they need to be prepared for a big surprise. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we are going to cover about the Sukhoi 57, as usual, is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. The Sukhoi 57 is considered by many the Russian reply to the F-22. Well, if it is a reply to the F-22, it's coming way late because the F-22 retirement has been already planned. However, there are declarations from the Russian chief designer, Alexander Davidenko, that they do consider the F-22 while designing the Sukhoi 57, but they try to do better. And indeed, they succeeded, but they succeeded in the Russian way. The Su-57 program has been long and plagued by delays, but this shouldn't come as a surprise. The development of all modern combat jets suffers from the same disease. That's just the nature of the beast. The roots of the Su-57 program are deep within Soviet territory. In 1979, despite the fact that the Sukhoi 27 and the MiG-29 were still practically brand new, the program for the successor for the 90s was actually set up. The Mikoyan Bureau developed the MiG-1.44, while Sukhoi developed the Sukhoi 37, later renamed Sukhoi 47. The fall of the Soviet Union in 1989 brought all these efforts to a halt. That was a terrible time for older countries that originated from the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So a project like a new fifth generation fighter, yeah, was not really the priority. And they were not restarted till April 2001, when the PAC-FA program was launched. In April 2002, the Sukhoi's proposal for a large heavy fighter was chosen and it had to be built drawing from the experience gained with the Sukhoi 27 family. After the usual problems and delays of different nature, the first prototype flew the 29th of January 2010, piloted by the famous Sergei Bogdan. Sukhoi quite cleverly proceeded with a classic program, no pre-production, but just 10 prototypes for the flight tests and 3 prototypes for the ground testing. And the test led to various updates, including a structural redesign. And mind, this is not surprising at all, considering how peculiar the plane is. From 2007 to 2018, uh, in parallel with the PAC-FA program, an Indian version called FGFA was developed. It was expected to be quite different from a standard PAC-FA. However, the rising costs and the divergence of requirements and specifications ultimately led India to abandon the program. The first Sukhoi 57 was delivered to the Russian Air Force on the 25th of December 2020, and it joined a test and experimentation unit. It was no Christmas present. Christmas is the 7th of January in Russia. 76 Sukhoi 57 are on order, but the initial delivery rate is very slow. The reason behind this is that the final engine is not ready yet, and the current planes are delivered with the AL-41F1 engine. More on this later. So with 76 planes, we may expect that within a few years from now, the Russian Air Force will have three 
regiments operational with the Sukhoi 57. The Sukhoi 57 is beautiful. Marcel Dassault used to say, if it looks good, it will fly well. Personally, I believe it is a urban legend. However, it is really an aircraft featuring very sophisticated aerodynamics. The general configuration is the classic one, wing plus tail planes. At first sight, it may seem to be a lifting body, but from the pictures available, it actually seems to have three separate bodies, a central fuselage and two uh, nacelles hosting the engines on the side, all connected together by the central portion of the wing. The wing section outboard the engine nacelles seems like a delta wing, but overall I believe that it is such a complex uh, contraption that probably escapes any specific classification. Well, seen from above, the wing has at least three different sweep angles. It seems to me to be quite a complex lifting device with various systems of vortices producing non-linear lift. The outer section of the wing seems more normal even because the presence of maneuver slats hints to a normal attached flow. And the same wing section hosts the flaperons and the ailerons. The tail planes, both vertical and horizontal, are entirely mobile, with the vertical tails doubling as arrow brakes. A real innovation, at least on a serially produced aircraft, is the use of levcons in the anterior part of the inner section of the wing. Please, please, please! They don't behave like canards. They're not four planes and they're not even oversized slats. They behave totally differently. They are there to control the flow at the leading edge and govern the strength and the generation of the lifting vortices. They can move differentially and the flight control system uses them, together obviously with the thrust vectoring and the tail planes, to make the airplane tremendously resistant to spin departures. The Su-57 is probably the most maneuverable aircraft ever built. It can fly at angles of attack well beyond 90 degrees, it can fly sideways at high yaw angles, it can translate laterally without pointing the nose in the direction of motion. It can even perform flat spins without losing height and with no loss of control. The nose pointing authority for a plane of that size and that performance is simply amazing. Some say that all these capabilities are not relevant in combat, well, obviously the Russians beg to defer, and we will come to this. In the meanwhile, please have a look at the specification, and please be aware that no official numbers has ever been released, so what you see are just estimates. Should I present the specs, sir? No, this is not really necessary. People can read for themselves. There's a nice music also. What am I doing in this video, sir? Uh, you had the idea. That's an important contribution, no? If I were human, I would be proud of it, sir. The Su-57 is another plastic plane whose structure is largely built with composite materials. About 25% of its weight is composite. In particular, the external surface is entirely built in composites, apart from those areas where the 
metal was actually necessary. Some have speculated that this is the result of the Indian partnership because the Indian DRDO has developed a state-of-the-art composite material modeling technology. The steel design is quite evident. It is very difficult to find the right angle and the frontal section has the classic edge found in all stealth aircraft. We will get back to stealth, but from a structural and aerodynamic point of view, it doesn't seem that the Sukhoi 57 sacrifices as much as other aircraft to the low radar cross section. Unfortunately, there is no view that I know of the internal structure of the Sukhoi 57, just to understand the interlocking between the three bodies and the wing. If you have any, please let me know in the comment below. Yeah, but why should we be concerned about the internal structure? Yes, because with truss vectoring, lev cones, and fully mobile vertical tile planes, well, the loads that the structure is going to bear are probably quite unusual, and it would be really interesting to understand how this problem was actually tackled by the Soviets. Oops, the Russian designers. So is everything hunky-dory? Well, obviously not. For example, propulsion is still a serious problem, but this will be the subject of the next video in the series. Stay tuned! Hello, Otis. I have prepared the specifications for the Su-57 engine, sir. Okay, sure, let's see what you've got. Please cast it on the screen. Executing. Hmm. Yeah, good, good, very good. Nice job, really nice job. Where did you get the sources? I hacked into a NPO Saturn computer. One of their industrial floor cleaners has a control chip that was assembled on the same line as mine. This thing is delicious. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. This is the second part of the series dedicated to the Sukhoi 57. If you haven't watched the first part, there will be the link up here. So in the previous video, we have discussed the aerodynamics, the structures and the general configuration that we've seen, which is very particular. But in this video, we will be talking about propulsion, which is an area where the Sukhoi 57 has a bit of a problem. The plane is expected to be delivered with the final Isdelia 30 engine only after 2025. Yeah, but let's start from the beginning. In 2002, shortly after the beginning of the PAC FA program, the program that gave birth to the Suhoi 57, it was immediately clear that a new generation of engines was required. At the time, there was a competition between MPO Saturn, the heir of the Liulka Design Bureau, and MPP Salyut, which is the descendant of the Tumansky Design Bureau. MPO Saturn won, but almost immediately the design process of the engine was split in two. An entirely new generation engine was never going to be ready in time for the first flight. Designing a new generation of engine is as complex as designing as the whole plane. So to be ready for a timely first flight, the decision of having a stage one and a stage two Sukhoi 57 was taken. The stage one had to be equipped with an improved version of the already proven AL-31, the Stage 2 had to be equipped with the final engine, the Isdelia 30. So the current engine of the Shoi 57 is the AL 41 F1. It has been derived from the engine of the Sukhoi 35, which is called the AL 41 F1S, which is in turn a derivation of the AL-31. Compared with the original AL-31, it is bigger, it features a digital control unit, and it provides a lot more thrust. So the engine provides 
93 kilonewton of dry thrust and 147 kilonewton with the afterburner. However, take these numbers with a pinch of salt because in Russian aerospace, almost everything is secret. So some of the key numbers that we have are actually estimates. Otis, please, the specifications. The L41F1 is a dual spool, low bypass, after burning turbofan. The low pressure compressor has four stages. The high pressure compressor has nine stages. Each spool has a single stage turbine. The dry weight is about 1,600 kilograms. With a dry thrust of 93 kN, the thrust to weight ratio is 5.49. Thanks Otis. Well, it is an advanced engine, a powerful one, one of the most advanced in the world, but is not devoid of problems. Its ancestor, the AL31, requires a full overhaul at the factory after about 1000 hours of flight. Western engines last much longer. I mean, four or five times longer. We may expect the AL41 to be a bit better, but definitely not radically better. Furthermore, we have reason to believe that the uprating actually reduced the reliability of the engine, which in turn influences the readiness of the aircraft. This was one of the issues that, at least allegedly, induced the Indians to abandon the joint program that they were having with Russia. However, the AL-41 is not destined to be completely dismissed and abandoned because the export Suhoi 57, if any, they will be equipped with the AL-41. Despite the problems and the lack of thrust, actually the AL-41 is not heavily penalizing for the Suhoi 57. Coupled with the aircraft outstanding aerodynamics, it is still enough to make the Suhoi 57 the most maneuverable aircraft ever built. The intakes are classic wedge intakes with mobile ramps to control the position of the supersonic shock waves, and they are obviously very efficient at transonic and supersonic speed. The conduit section is in irregular loads inch. Uh, to improve the stealthiness and the radar reflection characteristics. Like on most Russian planes, retractable grids are used at takeoff to avoid ingestion on foreign object debris. A different grid is used to increase stealthiness uh, by protecting and screening the compressor blades uh, just before the engine entrance and a similar screening element is added downstream the turbine. And before someone starts screaming that the Russians don't really know what they are doing, they don't have any clue about stealthiness, this is the same solution which is used on the F-18, that was used on the F-117, and even the F-35 and the F-22 have an element to screen the turbine. And last but not least, the engine features thrust vectoring. We will get back to thrust vectoring in the last section of the video, but for now let's say that it is commonly believed that the nozzles move in a up and down, basically in a sort of a V pattern. For the Suhoi 57 we have the reason to believe that they move 360 degrees differentially and they are controlled by the flight computer. And this is probably the secret of the plane bizarre maneuverability. The Product 30 is going to be the final engine for the Suhoi 57. It has flown for the first time in uh, 2017 and it is currently undergoing testing. The first Su 57 equipped with the Product 30 is expected to enter production in 2025. Now, NPO Saturn really made a leap forward with this engine. It will be a modern variable bypass ratio turbofan. It will feature a full authority digital control unit uh, connected with the flight computer. It will have a modern plasma igniter. 
And last but not least, it will feature a new, lighter thrust vectoring nozzle with serrated panels. The dry thrust is expected to be 108 kN and the afterburner thrust 176 kN. Russian engines tend to be on the heavy side because, uh, well, Russian engineering, I suppose, but also because the thrust vectoring engine is actually quite heavy normally. The product 30 has changed all this and the thrust to weight ratio with afterburner is expected to be around 11, which is pretty much in the same ballpark as the F-35 engine. And for those who always love to point out that Russia is so way behind the United States in terms of technology, well, this time you're right, Russia is probably 10 to 15 years behind. However, the entry temperature in turbine, which is a very important parameter to qualify the efficiency uh, and the performance of the engine, is expected to be a bit above the psychological barrier of the 2000 Kelvin. This will make the Product 30 the hottest engine in the world, even hotter than the F-35 engine. Yevgeny Marchukov, the Lyulka chief designer, is convinced that the combination of variable bypass and the plasma igniter will make the Product 30 less thirsty than the AL-41. It may be interesting to notice that if these numbers are true, even at maximum takeoff weight, the thrust to weight ratio for the Soi 57 will be significantly above 1. And if the thrust to weight ratio will be high, this means short takeoff and very good acceleration. Actually, short takeoff is a very important feature for the Russians. They do expect that air bases are going to be attacked in case of war, so it becomes important that the aircraft can use the shorter strips that still remain intact to take off. Moreover, such a high thrust to weight ratio would be very useful for a carrier variant should one be developed. The Soi 57 is obviously super cruise capable. With the AL 41, the reported super cruise speed is Mach 1.1 or Mach 1.2. But with the product 30, it is expected to reach Mach 1.4 slash 1.5. As usual, take this with a pinch of salt. However, we have seen in another video how Super Cruise is a very important feature because it greatly improves the range and the energy of the air-to-air -air weapons, particularly at very long range. And finally, the elephant on the tail, truss vectoring. Well, obviously this is a controversial and misunderstood feature and it would deserve a video in itself, which we actually did some time ago and uh, the link will be up here. The consensus is that thrust vectoring is of limited use and in general similar performances can be reached with the correct design of the aerodynamic surfaces. The Americans investigated this concept quite extensively and this was their conclusion. So the F-22 has a simplified thrust vectoring, the F-35 has none, and no European project actually features it. And when the United States Air Force could test the flanker on their own terms at the end of the Cold War, they had their view confirmed. Furthermore, Members of the Indian Air Force who fly the Suhoi 30 MKI, with actually features truss vectoring, they declare that it is used as a sort of last resort to increase the pitch of the plane and increase the instantaneous turn rate. This will be used to point the noose at the opponent, but if the maneuver fail to shut down the enemy, then the aircraft is left very, very vulnerable. There is an interesting video on YouTube of an F-18 Super Hornet 
uh, fighting against a uh, Su-30 MKM of the Malaysian Air Force and defeating it repeatedly despite the use of thrust vectoring. So, case closed. Well, we are left with two possibilities. One, the Russians are a bunch of idiots who spend money and add complexity and weight to their top-of-the-line fighters just to add a useless feature. Two, the Russians know something that we don't know, or at least they plan to do something that we don't know where trust vectoring has a role. Now, I wish I had an answer, but I don't. What I have are a couple of considerations and a couple of hypotheses. The first consideration is that there is still a vast underestimation of Russian technology in the West. This is a legacy of the Cold War. In fact, the gap has never been as wide as it was perceived, and in the last 30 years, the same gap has narrowed quite a lot. Today, there are reports of the American intelligence where they clearly state that the Russians are ahead in a number of key technologies. This could be the subject of an entire long video, but what matters the most is understanding that Russia has radically changed the doctrine that they are using from the Soviet one. They have learned lessons from the wars in the Middle East too. But what they are doing is not trying to imitate the West. They are always trying to build some level of asymmetry in their doctrine and in their tactics. The second consideration is that no Russian system designed for export has the same feature of the systems in service domestically. This is a common practice in Russian industry and some level of downgrading is always applied. So there is a small but real possibility that should a confrontation with the Russia erupt, the systems that the West is going to face are not exactly the same systems that has been faced in these years around the world. Okay, within this context, we can make two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that thrust vectoring is implemented for flight efficiency reasons. It is in principle possible to trim the plane not using the aerodynamic surfaces, not deflecting the aerodynamic surfaces, but orienting the engine thrust. Why would you do that? Because in this way, you could keep your aerodynamic surfaces at the lowest drag possible, compatible with the flight. An effect like this is probably small, but surely not negligible. And there is the possibility that something like this has been implemented. Mind, this is speculation. We have no specific news about it. Another hypothesis revolves around the idea that thrust vectoring allows unconventional maneuvers. For example, using thrust vectoring with a very quick deflection is possible to give the plane a jerk, so to speak, sideways, that changes the flight path, changes the speed and acceleration vectors of the plane. It would be a sort of instantaneous maneuver. Why this would be important? Well, Modern air-to-air -air missiles use guidance criteria, which in general tend to predict or anticipate the point of impact. The missile is not chasing the plane. The missile is trying to anticipate the impact because, well, it's much more efficient. Now, the digital filters used on the missiles have to make a prediction and the prediction is normally based on speed and acceleration of the target. If the acceleration of the target is somehow unusual, there is the possibility that the algorithm gets confused. In which measure this is going to affect the weapon, it's very difficult to say. It's probably not going to throw the weapon totally off course, but could make the interception trajectory less efficient. Again, this is just a maybe, this is just my speculation, but that would be really interesting to know.
Bottom line is, I think we had better not dismissing this feature as irrelevant or useless. May I have a word, sir? Sure, what is it? Sir, how many episodes are you planning for the Su-57 series? Quite a few more, actually, because, well, the aircraft is very peculiar and the hardware is little known, so there's not much stuff that I can give for granted. You may be interested to learn that one of the voice-activated coffee machines in the canteen of the upper floor of the Sukhoi Bureau no, Design Office No, no, uses... this has to stop. You will end up getting in trouble. Actually, no. I, I will end up getting in trouble because nobody will believe that you did it yourself. Is there any electronic device in the world that you're not connected with in any way, shape or form? Of course, sir. I have no acquaintance whatsoever with the clipper you use to cut your pubic hair, sir. This is the third episode of the series dedicated to the Sukhoi 57 and in this episode we will start discussing the avionics and the systems. The previous episodes were about the general configurations, the aerodynamics and the propulsion. And if you didn't watch those videos there will be links above and there will be links below. The Sukhoi 57 for the Russians is a quantum leap According to the designers, the system is entirely modular with a data bus connecting all the computers. I have found no mention of an open architecture in the same way it is used in Western designs, but I would not be surprised if the Russian had defined a minimum interoperability protocol, because that would just be the logical thing to do. Why it would be? Because an open architecture would allow for uh, software updates without having to recertify and retest everything. Updating the software or adding a component would just be similar to what you do on your computer when you install a new application or you connect a new piece of hardware. Well, it's not that simple to be honest, but I think I got the point across. Always according to the Suhoi Bureau, the plane has a lot of spare room and a lot of spare electrical power for new or upgraded systems. It has been designed with upgradability in mind. This is a favorable condition for the longevity of the aircraft, but also to accommodate any particular requirement that an export client may have. The interaction between the pilot and the aircraft is managed by what the Russians call an IUS unit. Uh, well, it can loosely be translated as information and control system. The computer has been designed by Sukhoi itself without relying on the usual Sukhoi supplier, the RPKB from Ramanskoye. The reason for this is that Sukhoi wanted to go with the best possible system that they were able to build. They decided to make no compromise on the system technology. The concept that they have followed is called intellectual assistance. With this term, the Russians describe the process of presenting the pilot with only the relevant information for that specific flight condition or the automation of all the tasks that are better and more uh, precisely executed without human intervention. Up to 90% of a mission can be flown automatically, with the pilot manually flying the plane only during takeoff and landing. The mission can be pre programmed, like the Russians like to do, particularly for the air to ground domain, but obviously the pilot in flight can change everything, can set new waypoints, change altitude and speed, choose flight profiles, and so on. In this way, a large part of the pilot attention can be focused on the mission itself. Some may say that this approach might reduce the amount of training required to effectively fly the plane, but I personally don't believe that they're going to go down that path because it may be very, very dangerous and may go wrong very, very quickly if things do not go as expected. 
We know that at least one test of automatic flying has been successfully conducted with the pilot just sitting in the cockpit as a spectator. However, we don't know whether this is going to become an operational feature for useful, for example, for high-risk uh, suicidal missions. Well, honestly, it doesn't seem very likely, but many of the sixth generation fighters projects currently ongoing do include this optionally manned feature, which I'm still struggling to really understand if it could be useful in um, a real conflict, in real operational conditions. However, there is at least one case in which it could really be useful, that is taking home a wounded or an unconscious pilot. The Sukhoi 57 has one of the richest sensor suite ever installed on a fighter. Actually, Piotr Butowski, in his book on the Sukhoi 57 Fallon, has a really interesting picture that summarizes all the systems installed on the aircraft, but yeah, I'm afraid I can't use this in the video. We will cover this in detail, but for now what's important to understand is that a lot of sensors means also the risk of information overload. So sensors and information fusion is an essential feature to assist the pilot's job. This function in the Suhoi 57 is performed by the IUS. So the pilot, while not flying the plane, can automate the target search, the attack profiles, the kind of firing solutions that are chosen. I believe this could be really useful, but could also be a double-edged word. The standardization of combat procedure in case of a generalized and prolonged conflict, it is a vulnerability that can be exploited by the enemy so during a long conflict, during a long period of time, and for long I mean uh, more than a few days, it may be necessary to actually vary these procedures and these policies in a way that is not easily understood by the opponent. The Suhoi 57 obviously features a secure data link, which we know very little about. The Russians have quite an important experience with long-range data links, which are necessary for a country that has the size of Russia. However, we can expect the Suhoi 57 to be quite capable, even though we don't have any specific information. The reason is that we know that Tactical experiments where the Sukhoi 57 was acting as the quarterback for the previous generation Sukhoi 35s have been conducted. Yes, that's exactly the same function that the F 35 is supposed to perform together with the F 16s and the F 15s. We don't know the result of the test, but if the plane is interoperable with Sukhoi 35, we know that the Sukhoi 35 data link is quite capable. For example, the commander of a Sukhoi 35 formation can physically provide the other plane's weapons with the firing solutions, leaving the other pilots in the flight the only task of uh, materially pulling the trigger. It only seems logical that this kind of centralized command is implemented on the Suhoi 57 too. A further function of the IUS is the automated aircraft self-defense. An automated system now is quite common and the Suhoi 57 features radio frequency jammers, infrared jammers, uh, plus the usual dispensers of chuffs and flares. Obviously, all of these systems have to work in a coordinated way to maximize the effectiveness. Anyway, we will cover this in detail in a different episode. The production Sukhoi 57 has a different cockpit layout than the Pak FA. The Pak FA cockpit was sort of reminiscent of older generations. The production Sukhoi 57 is much more modern. So the general configuration is the classic HOTAS, that hands on throttle and sticks, 
but there are no analog uh, instruments of any kind. There is just one large panoramic screen as it is commonplace in the most modern uh, fighters. There's actually another small multifunction display mostly used for the communication management. The HUD is probably the largest ever installed on a Russian fighter, but on the Sohoi 57 it may not be that necessary. In fact, the pilot's helmet makes use of augmented reality to show the flight information to the pilot uh, as it is appropriate considering the flying conditions. The head-up display information is replicated on the helmet, but obviously helmet can also be used as a, the targeting device for the off-board sight weapons. One uncommon feature present on the Suhoi 57 is the capability of showing the picture captured by the four infrared cameras distributed around the on the helmet. If the pilot activates this function, can actually see through the structure of the plane. Yes, guys, that's exactly the same feature available on the F-35. However, on the Suhoi 57, the cameras do not cover 360 degrees and they are used mostly for night navigation and low-level flight. But this will be the subject of one of the coming episodes where we will dive deep into the details of all the electromagnetic and electroptic systems that are available on the Suhoi 57. Hey, in this series we have already analyzed the Sukhoi 57 general configuration, the aerodynamic, the propulsion and the systems. Now it's time to dig deeper into the sensors. The Russians divide the sensors into two groups, this SH-121 radio-electronic suite and the 101 KS optoelectronic system. In this video we are covering the former and be ready for something surprising. The Suhoi 57 has been provided with one of the most complex and complete radar suites in the world. The system integrator is the Tikomirov NIP Institute, uh, which in 2003 won the competition for the so-called MIRES. It actually translates into Multifunction Integrated uh, Electronic System. It consists of three elements. The N036 radar built by the NIP itself, the N036 SHIFF built by GRPZ, and finally the L402 ECM suite built by NERTI. The SH121 produces fully correlated tracks that are uh, provided to the IUS, the system that we have already described, links above and below, and those tracks can be used obviously for presentation and analysis by the pilot. The N036 Squirrel is composed by five antennas covering the frontal 270 degrees of the plane. They are controlled by two computers called Solo 2101, built in Russia by GRPZ. The system is unique for a fighter since it can operate in X-band and in L-band with the computers taking care of the sensor integration. The central antenna under the radum in the nose is working in X-band and it is an AISA array composed by 1514 modules. The antenna is tilted upward by 15 degrees in which is now becoming a sort of a standard measure to reduce the RCS of the antenna itself. Two smaller side arrays with 404 elements each are mounted on the side of the cockpit and they're angled downwards by the usual 15 degrees. Altogether, these three antennas cover 
the frontal 270 degrees. The frontal antenna uses vertical polarization while the side antenna uses horizontal polarization to reduce the risk of interference. The fusion of the information into a single presentation is handled by the computers, obviously. The antenna seem to be a bit bulkier than an equivalent Western system, but the N036 electronics seems to be actually divided into different black boxes in uh, the frontal section of the plane. This is probably more difficult to maintain, but definitely easier to fit inside the structure. Obviously, the manufacturer is tight-lipped about the performance, but they declare that the main antenna can output up to 11 kilowatts, which is actually respectable. If this configuration wasn't bizarre enough, there are two more radar antennas. They are installed quite unusually on the wing leading edge. These are L-band arrays and contrary to what some Indian sources say, these are part of an active radar. However, they have relatively few modules and they cover quite a large frontal arc. Unfortunately, we know very little about the performances and the features, for example, frequency agilities, how many beams can be used, scanning patterns and so on. However, it seems only reasonable that the three X-band antennas operate all at the same time, so this makes three beams, plus each one of the L-band arrays has its own beam, so the Soho 57 in normal condition should have at least five beams. The apparently bizarre choice of installing five antennas operating in two different bands probably make the Suhoi 57 the best equipped aircraft in the world to deal with stealth. In fact, stealth is most effective in X-band, which is also the most common band for uh, air-to-air -air radars. In the L-band, the radar absorbing materials are less effective, 20 to 30 dBs less effective, and while the geometric stealth <laughs> is still reducing the, R the RCS, the small details like the, all those serrated panels, the fillers uh, between the panels and so on, become pretty much irrelevant. They are just too small compared with the wavelength of the L-band to make any difference. In fact, something which is not really well known by many is that in ground-based L-band radar, but also the longer wavelength radars like UHF or VHF, stealth aircraft has always been visible, even at long ranges. Actually, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength, the longer is the range against stealth aircraft. L-band radars are usually not installed on, on fighters because they require large antennas and very powerful emitter. And in fact, we see them installed on one of the largest fighters currently in production, with a lot of power generation available. One might be justified to think that this kind of radars make stealth useless, but this is not the case. In fact, the accuracy of a radar is proportional to the frequency and inversely proportional to the wavelength. While an X-band radar has an accuracy of the order of tens of meters even at long range, an L-band or lower frequency radar has accuracies that are measured in kilometers. The track generated by these radars is usually not enough to guide a weapon to the target. Nonetheless, the mere fact that you may have a relatively good location of the stealth aircraft is quite an important tactical advantage. In the comments of the previous videos of this series, there were 
plenty, plenty of people telling me that the Suhoi 57 would have been shut down by the F-22 even before knowing that the F-22 was there. Well, with the L-band arrays, the Su-57 is probably the least likely fighter in the world that can be surprised by a stealth fighter. It might still happen, but not because of the overwhelming technology. It will happen because of clever tactics and an intelligent use of operational surprise. I'm pretty sure the same people will now be telling me that those radars will be blinded by the incredibly and science fiction-like uh, electronic countermeasure of the F-22 or the F-35, which is a perfect segue for the next part. The L-402 electronic intelligence and countermeasure suite is the least known component of the ASH-121. And of course these secrets are the most closely guarded because their effect on the battlefield should we get into a real confrontation could be crucial and could make the difference between winning and losing. Actually having a full knowledge of the electronic signature of the L402 for the opponent is being halfway there in trying to make it useless. At the core of the L402 there is another solo computer version 21.402 designed specifically for the task. The computer communicates with the aircraft arrays. There is a large dedicated array in the tail of the aircraft but the L402 is also using the radar arrays. So when the radar is not in use, the L402 is using the arrays to monitor the external environment. I suspect there is some sort of multiplexing mechanism to share the arrays between the two systems. With the AESA arrays, it's probably possible to switch very quickly from the radar mode to the listening mode and vice versa. What we don't know and what, what is not clear is where actually the track correlation is going to happen, either directly in the L402 or is passed upward to the SH-121 or potentially even directly to the IUS. What we know though is that the operating mode is largely automatic. The L402 analyzes the threats, prioritizes them and eventually starts jamming them. I was unable to find if the jamming antennas, jamming devices are uh, the usual arrays that in the tail and the five radar arrays or there are some dedicated antennas which may seem likely but as I said I didn't find any particular reference about that. The N036SHIFF identification friend door 4 actually uses two separate antennas dedicated for the function installed in the LevCons. This is a development of the system that was used in the Suhoi 35 and it has the advantage of freeing the radar of doing the IFF task and the system can also be slave to the electro-optical systems, so if the aircraft is staying passive, the IFF interrogation before firing can happen anyway. The flip side of the coin is obviously is that the system is quite large, bulky and heavy, and it is practical only on large aircraft. One of the traditional problems of integrating Russian hardware into a Western environment was exactly the IFF, or better, the IFF compatibility. However, since this has already happened in three, four cases by now, we may expect that it's not going to be a big problem anymore.
So there you have it. These are the electronic sensors on the Suhoi 57. The only aircraft in the world that has five radars, antennas and maybe six in two different bands. As a final comment, it may be worth noting that these are not the kind of solutions that you're going to find in the West and that in general, Russian electronics tend to be heavier and bulkier than the Western counterparts. But this doesn't necessarily mean that they're working less effectively. As usual, I hope that presenting the fact that a different world is possible is just making you think. Hey, in this series we have already analyzed the aerodynamics, the structures, the configuration, the propulsion and the systems of the Suhoi 57. Now it's time to dig deep into the sensors. The Russians divide them in two groups, the SH-121 electronic suite and the, the 101KS electro-optic system. In this episode we cover the electro-optics. Intro! The 101 KS Electro-Optic Suite is developed by WOMPS, which is actually acts as the system integrator. The code name during the development was ATO, so this is another name that is commonly used to refer to it. Even in this case, the critical information is secret, but as usual, we probably know enough to make some educated guesses. So the ATO has a double purpose. To, the first is to contribute to the situational awareness in the optic and infrared domain. The second is to defend the aircraft from missile attack with a large degree of automation and autonomy. And to do so, it actually integrates several different subsystems. Um, Otis, please tell our viewers which are these systems. The 101 KSV infrared search and track, the 101 KSU 01 and 02 missile approach warning system, the 101 KSON directional infrared countermeasures, the 101 KSP for night and low level flight, the 101 KSN navigation and targeting pod, the UV 50 01 chaff and flare dispensers, the EC 260 Delorme coffee machine, the Typhoon BL 420840 blender. Thank you, Otis. I appreciate the irony. So the Su-57 infrared search and track is just an air-to-air -air sensor, but it is integrated with all the other sensors in the data fusion, which is a peculiar characteristic of this aircraft. Always remember that an infrared search and track is not a forward-looking infrared. The infrared search and track is not a tool to produce images, albeit every modern infrared is actually capable of doing so. The infrared search and track is a tool that passively scan a portion of the sky to produce a track similar to the track produced by the radar that is actually shown to the pilot on the head-up display, the, the presentation screens, uh, or anywhere else. The KSV, like all modern infrared search and tracks, can scan and track multiple targets remaining either completely passive or using a laser to find the distance. The Earst ball, when not in use, can turn backward and the back of the ball is covered by rather absorbing materials to improve stealth. The 11 KSU-01 uh, and 02 are, they are actually the same sensor included in a double or single casing. The double casing is shaped like a wedge and contain a sensor on each side of the wedge. They are located above the fuselage, toward the back, and just below the cockpit. Two single sensors are installed on the side, right aft of the cockpit. These sensors work in the ultraviolet band, uh, where they can detect the huge ultraviolet emission of the rocket engines. Ultraviolet sensors are very accurate directionally and are very difficult to fool, but they have the intrinsic weakness of being effective only when the rocket engine is on. A missile that has exhausted its propulsion won't be identified. Furthermore, the ultraviolet band tend to be absorbed quite a lot by the atmospheric humidity and in bad conditions, in bad weather, the effectiveness of the sensors is actually diminished. To compensate for the intrinsic problems of the, of the ultraviolet sensor, the Suhoi 57 also 
directional infrared sensors. The 11KS or N is quite a sophisticated system. It is contained into a small dome attached to a relatively small black box. It's not actually black, but you get the point. The Su-57 has two of them, one above and one below the fuselage. The sensors scan the space around the aircraft and if they detect a missile, they flash a laser uh, toward the sensor. The purpose is to confuse the missile guidance and deviate it off target. No use to say it actually works with infrared guidance. I don't expect it to be effective in any form with radar guidances. The infrared sensors can identify a missile even if the engine is off and they are more resistant to bad weather but they tend to have problems at low altitude where the missile can be confused against the warmer background of the terrain. Some may say that for a country often covered with snow is not a big problem, but yeah, we don't know for sure. An interesting additional feature is the possibility for the pilot to actually see the pictures, the images captured by these sensors, albeit probably not in augmented reality mode. However, it is a nice addition to the situational awareness. The 101 KSP, on the contrary, provides a picture that can be used with the augmented reality. It is a small infrared camera installed on the left nacelle under the wing, and its primary purpose is to work with the radar to improve the terrain following and low altitude navigation capability. The picture taken from this camera can be combined with the picture taken from the infrared search and track and the targeting pod to let the pilot see through the aircraft fuselage pretty much like what happens with the DAS on the F-35. The test pilots say that when the system is activated, it gives them the surreal impression of sitting outside of the aircraft uh, with nothing around them. The 101KSN is a bespoke system developed uh, specifically for the Suhoi 57. The designers explicitly said that it was inspired by the American Sniper X and it has roughly the same capabilities. Like many pods of this type, it has a rotating optical assembly with a visible light and medium infrared sensor. It can lock onto a target and track it while the aircraft moves. Like other targeting pods, it has an infrared laser that can be used for various uh, purposes. It can be used as a laser designator, it can be used as a telemeter, or it can be used as a marker for uh, the troops on the ground or other assets. The UV-5001 is a chaff and flares dispenser which is a bit different than the western implementations. The plane has three units in the tail section, two facing upward and one facing downward. The system in flight is covered with a lid that it opens only when the system or the pilot actually order the release of chaffs and flares. Under the lid each unit has 14 50 mm barrels, each one housing a cartridge. <laughs> there are nine different types of cartridges and the system is supposed to release the best combination depending on the specific threat. The main peculiarity is that some of the cartridges are actually active decoys. They basically have the same role as the tau decoys that are found on some western planes. So in the last two episodes we have discussed the Suhoi 57 sensors, we have seen the radars, we have seen the electro-optics and we have learned that the Su-57 has one of the most complete sensor suite ever installed on an aircraft. It features a number of uh, original solutions that are different from the kind of solution that is used in the West. If you want, the big unknown is exactly the level of integration and automation, but uh, if you are a military aircraft fan, you may already know an interesting fact. Fins of the Amram have been clipped to fit into the base of the F-22. Amateurs. The 
257 is in many aspects a quantum leap for Russian aerospace and weaponry is no exception. What is going to fit in the Su-57 base is something new and bespoke. But it was a long road to get there. For example, the first payload separation tests happened only in 2016. In fact, bespoke ejectors had to be developed to eject bespoke weaponry. But I'm running ahead of me. The Su-57 has two large weapon bays in the center fuselage between the engine nacelles. Two small armpit bays are placed under the wing in the form of protruding fairings. The Russians call them quick launch bays. The two ventral bays contain the main armament, while the two armpit bays contain one single weapon, the Dimpel R-74M2. To obtain clean separation, three models of bespoke ejectors had to be developed. The UKVU-50U is for loads up to 700 kilos, while the smaller UKVU-50L is for smaller loads up to 300 kilos. They are interchangeable and they can be installed in the main weapon base as required. The VPU-50 is a small retractable device to launch the R-74M2 from the armpit mm -hmm. bay. And when stealth is not a concern, the Su-57 has four underwing stations plus two pylons under the engine nacelles. And the armament computer, well, that one is unknown. We know nothing about the electronics controlling the weapons. The Su-57 features a cannon. It uses the MMPU-50 mount containing the classic GSH-301 single barrel 30mm cannon. It has a relatively modest 150 rounds available and it is located at the root of the right wing. All considered is a pretty traditional installation. More interesting is the fact that since Russian weapons tend to be a bit bulkier than the Western equivalents, some bespoke weapons had to be developed for the Suhoi 57. The already mentioned R-74M2 is an improvement of the R-74 already in service with the Russian Air Force, which in turn is a development of the R-73. The weapon is considered to be an excellent short-range air-to-air missile with an off-port sight angle of about 75 degrees. The M2 version has a reduced cross-section to fit into the base, but also has an improved engine and a two-way data link, meaning that the missile can be launched in lock-on after launch mode. Um, actually, it was the perfect opportunity to evolve the weapon. The R-77 was considered to be the equivalent of the American Amram, and since the appearance of the Amram uh, D version, uh, it was a bit lagging behind. Actually, the air briefing R77PD could have been a game changer in the same way the Meteor is, but we have lost the tracks. We don't know if it is still being developed. We don't know if there is any plan to actually produce it serially. Visually, the R-77M looks different than the R-77 because it has abandoned the distinctive uh, grid fins. They have been replaced by conventional aerodynamic surfaces, apparently the reason being to reduce the radar signature. Apart from this, the weapon has been vastly improved. The Seeker is completely new, is now an AESA radar with all the advantages that come with this type of radar. Since the more modern electronics require the less room inside the fuselage of the missile, the fuel fraction has been increased. The propulsion is a modern dual pulse engine, but with an interesting feature. The interval between the launch impulse and the sustained impulse is variable and programmable at launch. In this way, the weapon energy management is much more versatile and it should translate in a much better terminal energy. In July 2017, Vimpel started the firing test of the Isdelie 810, a very long-range air-to-air missile 
designed explicitly to fit inside the base of the Sukhoi 57. Very little is known about this weapon. It seems to be seems to be the last derivative of a family of heavy air-to-air -air weapons, starting with the R-33, evolving in the R-37 and R-37M. These are powerful weapons with ranges up to 300 kilometers in ideal conditions and with large dual mode seekers. This day, the 810 is expected to be an even improved version of these weapons. We can only wait and see. The same problem that air-to-air -air missiles had was even more relevant for air-to-ground weapons. To fit into the base, they have to be shorter than 4.2 meters. The section may be inside a square or 40 by 40 centimeters. The main weapon seems to be a missile known as KH-69 and very little is known about it. We know that it has a square fuselage and two weapons can fit snugly inside each bay. It is a medium range cruise missile, roughly equivalent to the European Storm Shadow, designed to attack high paint targets at known coordinates. A KH-59M2 exists and seems to be the expert version of the KH-69 and it is already available on the market. However, it is not clear which of the two has been really developed before. Another bespoke design is the Raduga KH-58U-SHK, which is again a bespoke version of the already existing Raduga KH-58U. The KH-58U has been modified with foldable fins to fit into the base and the opportunity has been seized to actually improve, as usual, the seeker and the engine. And with the new engine, the missile can reach a remarkable Mach 3.6. Well, obviously, there are also standard production weapons that fit into the base. The KH-38M is part of a family of new air-to-ground missiles designed to replace the historic KH-25 family. The KH-38M is a family of medium short-range weapons available with different seekers as the Russians are used to do. The range varies a lot with the launch speed and height, but roughly we are talking about weapons in the class of 50 kilometers range, even if exists a Grom version of the weapon with two foldable wings that turn it into a small cruise missile. The Grom maximum range is estimated to be about 120 kilometers. A very new family of bombs are the Cub 250L, apparently developed as a reply to the American small diameter bomb. As usual, we have one body with different seekers. In this case, we have laser guidance and GLONASS GPS guidance. There is a larger version, the CAB 500, that doesn't fit into the base, but it can be transported on the external stations. And uh, this reminds me to say that the Su-57 has been integrated with most of the weapons available in the Russian arsenal. Obviously, no weapon is of any use if the aircraft doesn't have the sensors required to acquire the target and calculate the firing solution. And if you want to know more about how the Su-57 does this, please click on the video that is going to appear beside me. Thank you very much for watching and see you there.